BBC and ITV are themselves biased and unbalanced, especially in the coverage they give to Britain's black community. Not only is a lot of this coverage not neutral, it actually reinforces racism. In the beginning, there was Lord Reef, the first Director General of the BBC. The interesting point in terms of social history is that this particular accent which the BBC produced somehow identified the BBC with a certain section of society, certain social trends, so that to this day the BBC is thought of as the organ of the, as it were, genteel and respectable elements in society. Anything wrong with that? Well, it's quite obvious we've put out the most awful black in that village and something's got to be done to smooth it all over. First thing, of course, is to return their statue thing. Well, I'll take it back personal, sir. Have a parley with you, Ed, man. I've got a sort of knack of talking to these native wallets. Get on with that pandering, you prize-eating burk. <laughs> Typical scene from a well-known comedy series. It's probably also fairly typical of what relationships were like between many white people and nations during the days of the British Empire. Lazy, skiving natives locked in a deceitful battle of wits against Lord Reith's genteel elements of society. How much do we pay the punk of all that? Three new pieces a week, sir. Let's see, that's about four and six, isn't it? That's correct, sir. Doesn't seem very much, does it? Or to give him a rise, say one more rupee? What do you think, Sergeant Major? Won't stop him falling asleep, sir. No, true. Besides, if we give one a rise, they'll all want it. We've only got one. <laughs> That's beside the point, Alfred. A thing like that can interfere with the whole structure of Indian society. You may think it's a good thing the British are able to laugh at their own past, but the British Empire was no joke for those on the receiving end. It's because of the poverty the Empire left behind that so many Asians and West Indians accepted invitations to come here after the war for work. So it's a bit of a turn-up for the books that one of the commonest jokes about Asians in television comedy today is that they work too hard. Good evening, please. Ah, Ranjit, you're late. I thought you weren't coming. You've missed the first half of the session. A thousand apologies, but I'm falling asleep on the underground queue. I'm working from six o'clock morning time until two o'clock afternoon time. Then I'm doing other job for garage pumping the petrol until six o'clock evening time. Well, even for, for the time you spend here, you could still have eight hours sleep. Oh, no. When I'm leaving here, I'm working in public house until after the midnight. I think you're overdoing it, Ranjit. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. This Jack, is he hiring three jobs also? <laughs> so, Asians work too hard. The implication is that they're probably taking away somebody else's job. Unless, that is, they're too busy scrounging off the dole. You're unemployed. Yes, please. <laughs> Only one day a week I'm working. Uh, what do you do then? I'm going to the unemployment exchange. For <laughs> to be collecting my money. Who oh, blimey. I get more money for not being working than when I'm working. <laughs> and if they do work, they're probably too stupid to understand about trade unions. Everybody who works here has to join the union. Ah, so you are also a member of union? Uh, no. Uh, no, no, he doesn't work here, he's just the management. What? <laughs> no, you see, we operate a closed shop. Shop? Is this not a factory? Oh, yes, it is. It's just an expression we use. It's no good, Paddy. She comes from overseas. She doesn't understand the way we go. <laughs> Here's a positive image of Asian women of a kind we don't see very often on television. When they do defy the media stereotype and fight for trade union recognition, as here at Grunwick's, they're cast in the image of troublemakers. So stereotypes do affect people's lives. The trouble is that you can laugh at the joke and accept the stereotype at the same time. After all, the media don't only give us information about the world we live in, they also shape our attitudes towards it and jokes can strengthen our prejudices even while we're laughing at them. Last year at the Edinburgh Television Festival, the point was put to Michael Grade, program controller of London Weekend Television. I would like to ask you if you don't think that that is nothing but stereotypes, 
based on the English attitude, which is all foreigners are funny, or wogs are funny, or Irish are funny, Greeks, everybody. Answer. <laughs> I agree with you. I suppose any of you have a spare room, do you? It would give me much pleasure for you to share my humble house. But unfortunately, my cousin and his family, and also his cousin and his family, is staying with me. <laughs> You've got two families both living in one house? Two families both living in one room. <laughs> I don't think that series is socially damaging. I hope it isn't, otherwise we really oughtn't to be doing it. But I think that what people get out of that is a lot of enjoyment. I don't think it's at the expense of the characters. I think there is a, a multiracial community working in that classroom at some level which is enjoyable, which may make people who are not members of any of those racial minorities friendlier towards the races that they see portrayed there without saying, when they meet an Indian in the street, uh, oh, he always talks like that and he's funny because he wears a turban. Well, in the cosy atmosphere of Edinburgh, the television professionals may think ethnic humor about blacks who work too hard, scrounge off the dole, and live two families in a room is just entertainment. The fact remains that in Britain today, this is what most white people believe about blacks. And the fact that television is always making jokes about it makes them feel justified in despising black people. The comedy makes it okay, natural, acceptable. If you think this is an exaggeration, look at the way exactly the same attitudes dominate the outlook of serious television documentary makers when they deal with what they like to call racial problems. For instance, when Philip Tibbenham and the Tonight team went down to darkest Blackburn, they made a joke about blacks and overcrowding, the starting point of their investigation. Predictably, the Asian populations drifted into its own ghetto, sprawling on either side of a long road called Wally Range. The standing local joke is for bus drivers to announce it as the Khyber Pass. But part of the problem in Blackburn is that some immigrants are on the move. This used to be a solid immigrant area, but it's been demolished under a slum clearance program. That's meant that some Asians have spilt over into adjacent white working class areas. And there are those who don't like it one bit. This Tonight Report and Mind Your Language both start from the same assumption. The problem isn't the hostility which Asians face when they move out of the ghetto, but the fact that they're spilling out into adjacent white working class neighborhoods. Blackburn's problem is that some immigrants are on the move. In political terms, it led to something quite startling for Blackburn. At the recent local elections in St. Thomas's ward, normally regarded as totally safe for Labour, John Kingsley Reid, chairman of the ultra-right-wing National Party, came top of the poll. Here comes the John Wayne of racism striding out of the West. For a man who didn't form his party until earlier this year, Kingsley Reid's achievement has been remarkable. And no one questions that the success has been based on his open distaste for the coloured immigrants and his demands for their immediate repatriation. When did building up a successful racist party become, in the BBC's language of neutrality, a remarkable achievement? Can you imagine a report describing the rise of the Black Panthers as a remarkable achievement? Still, the cameras don't leave us in much doubt where Blackburn and Mr. Reid are concerned. Here he is again, shown as a respectable politician, hard at work in his front room. And he has a story to tell our reporter. I've got many and many uh, complaint about immigrants taking the toilets out and actually parceling up their excretion, etc., and sticking it in the back alleys. Here, the freedom of the air is the freedom to allow unsubstantiated racist slander to pour out from the screen over the audience. Now Mr. Reed has the reporter's ear. It's an intimate little scene. The attention he's getting from the reporter lends what he's saying credibility. When last did you see a black person on television getting this undivided attention? Still, as every good BBC reporter knows, when racist allegations become too strong, even they have to counter them. Now, there are lots of disturbing things about this whole Blackburn situation. For example, we asked the local council if they'd investigate the allegations of smashed toilets and pipes blocked by offal. And after a thorough search, the health department came back with the answer that there's not a shred of evidence to support either of the stories. I suppose, strictly speaking, this is the famous BBC balance and impartiality in action. Current affairs programs aren't supposed to express a viewpoint. They have to be impartial. 
And when the allegations in that Blackburn program got too outrageous, the reporter did tell us there wasn't a shred of evidence to support them. But formal balance is one thing, and the impression which strong images make is another. This isn't an accusation against a particular reporter. It's a question of how the media as a whole work, and of how television works on the audience. Those last extracts, we had vicious allegations against blacks made in a confidential and authoritative way, and denials tentatively made later by a reporter stumbling up a back street in Blackburn. Which do you think made the stronger, more memorable impact? Even Philip Tibbenham had to admit. But the fact is that the Kingsley Reed version has already gone into the mythology of Blackburn. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people actually believe that it's true. Yes. Thanks to such stories, not thousands, but millions now believe it. And television helped to make those myths believable. And somehow the myths keep creeping back into the program. TV reinforces those myths simply by using them as a colorful lead into the next race story. Just good, strong television. In the next extract, our guide is not a racist politician, but an expert who wrote what is a supposedly impartial report for the police about young blacks and crime in Birmingham. The expert, inevitably white, is an important figure in television documentary because he isn't seen to take sides. He has the authority of a man who knows. The next documentary is from the award-winning Shades of Grey, and listen to the way the expert's piece to camera moves from one stereotype to another. Imagine young West Indians, perhaps born in the early 60s, come onto the labor market just at the worst time, a time of high unemployment, particularly for young people. And then they get perhaps involved with the police in some act of minor delinquency. The police come round, the parents themselves get het up, reject their children, and this act of rejection is very common in many ways. And so, leaving their parents, they go and shack up with others of their kind in squats or in communes. On the one hand, searching for purpose, searching for identity. Other hand, perhaps involved more and more in criminality, acts of violence against the old and defenseless. Yeah. It's a terrifying scenario. It is indeed. But what's really terrifying is the way the scene is being set. This is the archetypal picture. Black communities seen exclusively in terms of crime, unemployment, family breakdown and problems. The problems are always explained by white experts. In fact, racism is a white problem. But from Blackburn to Birmingham to Brent, wherever the television eye turns, it sees the same story. Brent isn't notorious for racial trouble, like Notting Hill, for instance, though it is probably the blackest borough in Britain. Of every ten babies born here, four are non-white. Bob Butterick lives on the huge Stonebridge estate. Here, white families are outnumbered three to one by blacks. What is it that really upsets you about this estate? Well, it's the, the vandalism. The noise, you uh, come out your street door, you ask to be quiet in a nice way and they just look at you, going in white trash. Blacks may outnumber whites by three to one, but the BBC seem to have trouble finding them, since none on the estate are interviewed. The microphone is given to a white resident, and again, the reporter lends a sympathetic, professional ear. Out it comes, and it, afterwards people just use it as a dust doll. How do you know it's black children doing it? Because I look out the door. Would you call that convincing evidence? Was it substantiated by any of the black residents on the estate? It would have been nice to know their view. Instead, we're given a guided tour of the lift shaft and more stories of excreta. White citizens, though, are given the freedom to air their prejudices. What's it like to live here? Absolute hell. Are whites going? This is a program where the black majority, who are said to be the problem, are invisible. And the whites, who are having the problem, hold the camera. No one questioned whether you only find run-down condition and social problems on housing estates where blacks are in the majority. It isn't only what the media say. It's what they don't say, but take for granted. Whenever programs are made about blacks, the starting point is always numbers. And there's nothing that factual television loves so much as a good solid number, unless it's a comparison between two numbers and a bit of zappy graphic work. Because dealing with large figures is notoriously muddling, we've devised a way of illustrating numbers. We're taking Wembley Stadium as a symbol to represent 100,000 people. 
Now, how big is Britain's non-white population? According to government figures, 1,800,000. That's the reality. So, now it's not just streets full or rooms full of blacks, they're counting them in stadiums. What other social group would the media dare to count in that way? Jews? Catholics? How many Wembley stadiums of Australians, Canadians or white Rhodesians do you think there are in Britain today? Of course, a number is a fact. And current affairs television loves a fact because you can't quarrel with it, it must be true. Can you remember, as a matter of fact, how many Wembley stadiums the Blacks and Asians filled up? Now for the public perception of those in our sample willing to make an estimate, two-thirds thought there were more non-whites in the country than there actually are. As many as 14% overestimated wildly thought the number of non-whites has reached 10 million or more. Perhaps we get our numbers wrong because we get a steady diet of documentaries from Blackburn, Birmingham and Brent on the so-called immigration problem. Of course, as soon as you say numbers, it doesn't matter how you wrap it up. There's only one lesson to be drawn. The numbers are growing. There are too many of them. Here's something better than a number. A number plus an expert. To do this, we've commissioned a special assessment by a man who has no political acts to grind, who is not involved with race relations or with the government. So that's real neutrality for you. But what's his story? He's a population statistician. The fertility consequences can be seen much more clearly if we have a look at the completed family sizes. This completed family... But the main reason the fertility expert's on the program is because he knows how fast people breed. He lends an air of authority to the numbers game. And where blacks are concerned, the only problem is how many of them are there going to be? which is the major question of Asian fertility. The Asians are the significant factor in the future change. Let's give the media the benefit of the doubt. Just suppose the aim of that program was to debunk the myth about black numbers. In fact, if you always only talk about blacks in relation to numbers, the audience cannot help but think that that must be the problem. The possibility that the problem might lie with white society is never considered. There's only an inch or two of film between those absurdly scientific Wembley stadiums and the emotive language of the racists about Britain being swamped by people of an alien culture. And if numbers is the problem, then repatriation must be the answer. Whether you like it or not, that's a racist logic. That's what the emotive language of British racism feeds on. Immigrants equal blacks equals too many of them equals send them back. This chain of reasoning has dominated the so-called immigration debate, at least since 1968, when Mr. Powell first stated the so-called facts and drew the deductions about black people in Britain. Here he is being interviewed with great reverence by that well-known Canadian immigrant, Professor Robert Mackenzie. Mr. Powell, we're here in the room in which you made your most famous speech, probably, on immigration in 1968. Now, the campaign to restrict immigration had been underway from the mid-50s. Now, after a decade of saturation coverage like that, Powell and his views have been made respectable by television. It's not just that whenever the media debates race, they turn to Powell. The fact is that the debate starts from Powell's racist chain of reasoning. We'll either have gone or we'll slip out from under somehow. A harsh prediction from Enoch Powell. Is he right or wrong? And is it a matter of figures? Tonight, we're going to examine the number of non-white... Powell is now the media's superstar on race, and everybody defers to his opinion as if it were gospel truth. He defines the terms, he sets the agenda, he's helped to ensure that the question is the question of immigration. A ritual occasion, like a cross between Westminster Cathedral and the Old Bailey, on the throne, the most neutral of neutral chairmen. Good evening. Welcome to our debate for the next 90 minutes on the topical, difficult and important question of immigration. Here beside me is the Home Secretary... The question of immigration was the big prestige media production on race relations. For its 90 minutes, it was obsessed by the questions of numbers and repatriation. And the guest of honor, setting the agenda again... There's Mr. Enoch Powell, for instance, who almost exactly 10 years ago in Birmingham 
made the first and most sensational of his many... Well, Mr. Powell, uh, may, may say, he has said, and he'll speak for himself this evening, that these figures, 40... 40 Let 40, me put a point to you on which Mr. Enoch Powell is certain, and he may be able to follow it up later. He has said many times, so long as there is in this country a large new Commonwealth population, and it's what Mr. Powell is saying, yes. forget about these numbers of trickled people coming in and right. whether they're wives and so on. The fact is you're going to get immigration going on as long as you've got a big immigrant population. How would you reduce the numbers from being far too many to being very much less? In other words, the numbers living here has got to be reduced by some, something called repatriation or resettlement, which... Uh, Mr. Powell and others. In the advocate. course of transition. Now, I if want to come, if come on If he'd have been living next to Polish on. Jews. I want to bring you back to what you were about to talk about, namely Mr. Powell's argument for repatriation, which is our uh, final theme. And I want you to uh, uh, say, Mr. Lyon, in one further answer, whether you agree with point, Mr. Powell. With and Anyone who tried to change the terms of this debate got short shrift from the chair. Uh, hold on a moment. Uh, hold on a moment, will you please? Hold on a moment. Uh, you are Councillor Walker? That's right. And where do you come from? Camden. And would you please say what you have to say? So I that would I love have to. You haven't Some given us a chance. Like I can't. There are a lot more people in this room who can all speak at once. Certainly, but you have taken the front bench rather preponderantly. What that I'd was like what to you say here. That yeah. was what you were told would happen. You yeah. shouldn't have come if you wanted to hold the floor yourself I'm all the time. I'm not wanting to. Okay, go ahead, I'm Mr. Walker. Free speech. As soon as you start defining black issues in terms of numbers and repatriation, you play straight into the hands of extremist racist groups with their solution of forced repatriation. And in recent months, the media has given increasing airtime to these racist groups. This is a change in BBC policy from the days of Sir Hugh Green. He said the BBC couldn't be neutral between racism and anti-racism. The present chairman of the BBC, Sir Michael Swan, thinks otherwise. I believe it is vital to display the rhetoric of the National Front. Who knows, exposure may even persuade them to alter their tune. What he's really saying is that extreme racists have become part of balance, an acceptable point of view within the spectrum of political opinions. Can you imagine the media displaying the rhetoric of, say, black revolutionaries on the grounds that exposure may even persuade them to change their tune? Well, displaying the rhetoric of the National Front has now become a respectable studio chat between two white equals, allowing the racists to spell out their propaganda to millions. You have a plan which you've already uh, mentioned to me, and this comes out of your policy document, of uh, advising the repatriation, I'm quoting now, by the most humane means possible of those coloured immigrants already here, together with their descendants and dependents. Yes. How many people is that? There was no challenge there on what forcible repatriation actually means. How far away is this from a balanced discussion on whether to repatriate people by air or by sea? That interview continued in the same cosy vein, with Webster of the National Front reminiscing unchallenged about his Nazi past. This next interview hardly exposes the rhetoric of racism any better. David Duke of the Ku Klux Klan, wanted by the Home Office and the police as an illegal entrant, is actually in a television studio. You are reported as having a message for the people of Britain. What is your message to the people of Britain, essentially? One of the main things is that they're not alone, that there are white people all over the globe that, that sympathize with... When last did you hear a television interviewer say, Mr. Fidel Castro, I understand you have a message for the British people. This isn't giving the racists enough rope to hang themselves with. It's allowing them to get away with murder, and all the time in the name of balance and good journalism. In the name of balance, the stronger racism becomes, the more airtime it gets. And in the name of balance, whatever that term may mean, you'd expect them to give equal treatment to the anti-racists. So take a look at these extracts from one of the few reports about the Anti-Nazi League, Britain's biggest anti-racist umbrella organization. Using all the tricks of the advertising trade, the message of the League is, anti-racism is good for you. It's got laughs, it's got style. You can even set it to music. The League claims a membership of 30,000, and within that, a complex network of small groups actively selling its message. But do they really exist, except on days like this, at free concerts? For example, it's difficult to actually meet a skateboarder against racism, or to find really dedicated followers who haven't just added one more protest slogan to a very long list. For the school kids alone, it's the first slogan they've adopted. There's genuine... So, fighting racism is seen as a con trick, using gimmicks to seduce naive school kids who don't really understand what racism is about. 
According to the Tonight film, the Anti-Nazi League is a cunning, manipulative organization little better than the racist forces they oppose. Here's the final message of this program about people who are fighting racism. How effective has the League really been? At a time when electoral support for the National Front has declined, violent racial hatred is increasing. There are daily assaults on Asians in London's East End, and just a few days ago in Bradford, a shotgun attack on an Asian restaurant. The badges and carnivals of the League have made no impact on the growing problem of hidden prejudice, which prefers another kind of badge. This film story works to make the Anti-Nazi League ineffective. And even with racism on the increase, there's little coverage of any other anti-racist organizations, the ones run by blacks for themselves, for example. We'd like to show you one more piece of humbug from the BBC's film about the Anti-Nazi League. But the League does boast of support we know it doesn't have. Its most controversial campaign is to get the National Front banned from television screens. And the League claims widespread support amongst broadcasting staff. As a matter of record, Sally Hardcastle apart, a growing number of media workers are opposed to the National Front getting free airtime. And the report was wrong about the campaign, which is not to keep the National Front off the air, but against the kind of uncritical coverage we've seen earlier. The executive of the National Union of Journalists has come out strongly against the Pull the Plugs campaign, calling it censorship. Well, let's talk about censorship. The BBC have effectively tried to censor the programme we're making today. The corporation's news department has denied us access to any of their material. Independent television news and many commercial companies have been similarly obstructive. Why this interference? Here's what the BBC's head of news, Alan Prothero, said about the issue at a committee meeting of news and current affairs editors. Why should an organization, the campaign against racism in the media, which might well accuse myself and my staff of racism, be given privileged treatment? Why indeed? But is it a privilege to try and deal in a half an hour with literally thousands of hours of television broadcast each year? And who's really privileged when the news is above criticism? Here's the justification of the ban given us by the BBC's chairman, Sir Michael Swan. We are not prepared to release news film to fulfill an avowedly partial purpose unless we are totally reassured about the context and form in which it is to be used. Our concern in this program is that the unavowedly but dangerously partial attitudes of the BBC should not be placed above suspicion. Racism has never been put in a critical context by the media in this country. When it comes to fighting racism, the media are part of the problem. They perpetuate myths and stereotypes about black people. They lie by omission, distortion and selection. They give racists inflated importance and respectability. But what does all this mean to you? The most important thing we're saying is don't trust the media. Don't take television, the press, radio at face value, and above all, don't take them sitting down. The campaign against racism in the media is made up of people who work in the press and broadcasting, but the media are too important to be left to the professionals. You can do something about the media, and you can get your voice heard, especially if it's organized. If you want to know how the campaign against racism in the media is organizing, here's our address. Campaign Against Racism in the Media, P.O. Box 50, London, N1. It seems tragic and ironic that we, as broadcasters and journalists, have had to go through the back door of Open Door to make this program. In this half-hour program, we haven't even touched on foreign coverage, the whiter-than-white -white coverage of the police, the employment of blacks in television, black culture, or news bias in press and TV. We believe these issues should be raised in mainstream television programs. But will they be?